Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently have had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Wallace Wawa Jones, the greatest athlete in the history of the University of Kentucky who died recently at the age of 88. Wawa Jones came from eastern Kentucky from Harlan, coal mining country. His parents had a diner where they served the coal miners, and as a boy he was witness to some of the labor trouble between the unions and the company in the 1930s. One saw the Union men try and get into the company commissary, where they were machine gunned by company thugs. Wawa went on to become one of the greatest basketball players in Kentucky history, and in that state that's saying something. He led the Harlan Green Dragons to the state title in 1944, went to the University of Kentucky where he played on two national championship teams, and was named an All-American. Those national championships were in 1948 and 1949, and the 1948 national champions were led by center Alex Gross and guard Ralph Beard, along with Wawa. They were known as the Fabulous Five, and they were coached by the legendary Adolph Rupp. All five men went on to play in the 1948 Olympics, where they earned a gold medal. But besides that, Wawa also played football, where he was an all-conference wide receiver for the only Kentucky team that ever won the conference title. And that Kentucky team was coached by none other than Bear Bryant. So Wawa Jones played for Adolph Rupp and Bear Bryant two of the most legendary coaches in college sports. Bear Bryant left Kentucky a little while after that to go to Texas A&M, and then after that to Alabama, of course. I don't think he wanted to compete with Adolph Rupp in a basketball state. Anyway, back to Wawa. He was a superb baseball player drafted by the Boston Braves, and he was also a track star. So he was a four-letter man of Kentucky drafted by three professional teams, and along with that, a gold medalist. Last year at Rupp Arena, start the basketball season, they introduced Wawa Jones along with Anthony Davis, who won the 2012 gold medal in basketball after playing for Kentucky. Anthony Davis, by the way, from Chicago. Here is the introduction. And the best athlete to ever put on a Kentucky jersey. Played football, baseball, and basketball. And you asked him, what's his favorite sport? He said, whatever was in season. Like the fabulous five to the 1948. now to our feature captain Theodore Dutch Van Kirk who died recently at the age of 93. Captain Van Kirk was the last survivor of the 12 men who piloted the Enola Gay on August 6, 1945 and dropped the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. The team was led by Colonel Paul Tibbetts who named the plane after his mother and bombardier Tom Farabee and Colonel Tibbetts selected Captain Van Kirk to be his navigator. Here's a brief interview with Captain Van Kirk right after the bomb known as Little Boy was dropped. This is Captain Theodore J. Van Kirk of Northumberland, Pennsylvania, Colonel Tibbetts' navigator. Captain Van Kirk, what was your feeling when you made your first landfall on the Empire? Well, I knew when we hit the coast of Japan that we were well on the way to completing a successful mission and that the new bomb we carried would be a great help in shortening the war. Here's a longer extended interview with Captain Van Kirk. It's actually a compendium of two, one from CNN and one personal where he's reflective about the dropping of the atomic bomb. I probably, I think I probably flew about 15 missions out of England, and then I got transferred down to North Africa where I completed the rest of uh, 58 of them. If you made 25 missions, you were either the luckiest person alive or the German pilots were lousy shots. In my case, the German pilots were lousy shots. I was down in New Orleans, I got a call from Tibbetts. I met Tibbetts before that, before I flew the first mission out of England. That was the best day of my life. He saved my life a couple of times. He says, I'm organizing a new group. Can't tell you what it's about, but he says, if it works, we're either going to end or officially shorten the war. He says, I want you to be my group navigator. I got orders to report to the Silver Plate Project in Wendover, Utah. We trained primarily to make a, the rapid turn and running away from the bomb. That was our primary training. That was our biggest worry, was getting away from the bomb. You know, how do you get away from the bomb? You drop the bomb, the, the bomb goes this way, you go this way, but you had to make a very rapid turn. There was practice, he could make that turn in less than a minute. So you're at 30,000 feet now. He's in a 30, 60 degree bank, which is a very sharp bank for B-29 at that altitude. Well, that day wasn't the important day because uh, the, the drop by 9.15 and 8.15 in the morning, 10 a.m. time, 
9.15 Tinian time, 8.15 Hiroshima time. So it was all over by then. But the day before was the important day because uh, you have to go back and realize what happened during this period. The bomb was developed by the Manhattan Project. There were hundreds of thousands of people working on the Manhattan Project. They built three cities, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Los Alamos, New Mexico, and uh, Hanford, Washington, just to produce to research how to make the bomb and make the materials then from which to make the bomb. This effort had been going on a long time, ever since the beginning of the war, when Einstein wrote a letter to Franklin Roosevelt saying that it might be possible to make an atomic weapon. We had started preparing to drop the atom bomb in the fall of 1944 before we even had a bomb. And then they had a test of the, one of the first atomic bombs in Alamogordo, New Mexico, on July 16th of 1945, after that, everything started getting hotter and everything of that type. And we knew we were going to have a weapon to drop. Tibbetts, Ferry, and I were in the same pulpit. We obviously didn't sleep. We get down to the airplane. That's the first thing. It just says 245 comes in while we take off. The first problem was getting off the ground. We were very heavily overloaded. Just before we paid to 10,000 feet, uh, more did the final arming of the bomb. And after that, says, didn't that make you nervous? I says, hell, I'm nervous already. What, what, how much more nervous could I get? And we're about 30,000 feet. I could see the, the outline of Japan for miles away. I went in, crossed Shikoku. I turned to the westerly heading and uh, t- called Tom Farabee. And I say, if you can't see it now, you're blind. The city of Hiroshima is up there, and you can see the bridge. That was, uh, was our aiming point. It took the bomb 43 seconds from the time we dropped up at 30,000 feet until the time it exploded at 18,000 feet. The first thing you saw was that large white cloud that was up well above our altitude. If you look down to the city of Hiroshima, it just looked like a pot of boiling oil covering the city. When the drop came, the plane surged because you suddenly lost 9,400 pounds. And Timbers took over manual control again and made the turn to get away from the bomb. The biggest thing that we were concerned about was, is this bomb going to work? Because this was a bomb that had never been tested. This was a a uranium-235 bomb that had never been tested. The one they tested was a plutonium bomb. So was it going to work or wasn't going to work? And it took 45 seconds from the time the bomb left the airplane until it exploded. Everybody was sitting there timing it in some way, shape, or form. I had a watch, so I knew what the time was. The other people were counting 1,001, 1,002, and so forth. Suddenly, the bomb went off, and you saw a bright flash of light in the airplane, so you knew the thing had worked. And the only question then was, what was it going to do to the airplane? So we were going away from it at this time. We got putting distance between us and the bomb. Kept that up. After a a very short time, we got the first shock wave, which was measured about 3.5 Gs. You're up there in Washington, you know all these military people. You know what a 3G is and everything of that type. So it doesn't seem like much to a fighter pilot, but if you're in a B-29 at 30,000 feet, it seems like a hell of a jolt. Then we turned around after we weren't sure we weren't going to get any more shockwaves. You knew a tremendous amount of damage had been done underneath that. I was happy it worked. That's number one. We had been in a long war. We had been attacked by the Japanese. The Japanese people were not nice people in those days. My next-door neighbor, who was a prisoner of war all the time, has more stories about this to tell than I can tell. But we had the Baton Death March, all the casualties we took down in the Solomons and this sort of thing. The policy of the United States government at that time was to subdue the nation of Japan. And I was willing to do anything I could do to help that out. My policy also was to subdue Japan. Let me make one comment here. The Japanese you know today are not the Japanese we fought during World War II. The Japanese of today are nice people and everything of that type. We've had Japanese students living with us in our homes out in California for many, many years. I, I couldn't ask for better. But the Japanese during World War II were not that nice of people. That's all I'll say about them. If I, if I had been living in Hiroshima or in Nagasaki at that particular time, I probably wouldn't forgive me either because those people suffered an awful lot. But whether they will accept it or not, Dropping the atomic bomb saved their lives and our lives, Japanese lives. If we had had to invade Japan, the Japanese casualties would have been much higher. 
and our fire stories would have been terrific. You know, they're still giving out Purple Hearts that were made to give a wild in the invasion of Japan. We still haven't used up all the Purple Hearts that were manufactured at that time. It was not a nice war. 50 million people got killed during World War II, and they all have bad stories to tell about it. Three main options. One was to put a blockade around Japan and starve the people to death. How do you starve people to death that are already living on 1,000 calories? You can't do it. They said that then the other two options were drop the atomic weapons or put a full-scale invasion into Japan. The atomic weapons would have resulted in less casualties overall than if the invasion of Japan would have done. If you ask any GI, they would ask anybody the it was in the service over in over the Pacific. You, they, they love the atomic bomb. Everybody who's in the Pacific at the time says, will come up to me and say, you saved my life. I regret we ever had to have mission. I regret every mission I had over in Europe and everything of that type. I dropped a lot of bombs over there that killed people and probably killed some Israelians. Do I regret the atomic mission? I regret we had to do it. There's a fellow here the other day, and what was it he was saying that the Japanese should apologize to us for making us drop the atomic bomb? That was a new twist on things I've never had occurred before. I regret that we had to do it, but I think we had to do it in order to end the war with a minimum loss of life. I, I say that any politician, any diplomat, anybody in any area of authority today, I would like never to see another atomic weapon used, but I'm afraid we're going to. If everything was exactly the same as it was then, that's the point. But if the same situation existed, again, exactly as it had back in 1945, yes, I would go on it. I would volunteer for it, as a matter of fact. I'd want to go on it. Well, on that note, we're going to segue and close with James Shigeta, who died recently at the age of 85, one of the great Asian-American actors of the post-war era. He had Japanese parents, but he was born in Hawaii. He started in a made-for-TV movie about the Enola Gay, but he was more famous for another couple of movies. And in one, he plays a Japanese diplomat who marries an American girl, and they have to suffer through World War II and Hiroshima. From 1961, it's called Bridge to the Sun with Carol Baker. A young lady should not be alone at reception. Hello, Mr. Takasuki. Hello, sir. First name is Hidenari. Very difficult to remember, Mrs. Tyson. Oh, Harold, Miss. First name, Gwen. Very easy to remember. Perhaps you attended the reception at the Brazilian embassy last week? Me? Oh, heavens no. I'm just visiting Washington. Such a beautiful place. And Oh, look, Mr. Terrace. Come. Here. I will show you our objects of our embassy. This is very sweet of you, but you must have more important things to do than show me around. Better you than large ladies with three chins who ask foolish questions. He was good in that. He was good looking. He could act and he could sing. And his most famous role was a little before that in the film version of the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical Flower Drum Song. And he actually did the opening number, You Are Beautiful, better than it was done on Broadway. What is it, May Lee? Look at me, May Lee. I want to tell you a story. Along the Huangho Valley, where young men walk and dream, a flower boat with singing girls came drifting down the stream. I saw the face of only one come drifting down Stream. You are beautiful, sunshine. You are the girl whose eyes met mine just as your boat sailed by. All that talent, his career should have taken off after that, but it never did. He got one of the schlock roles in one of the Die Hard movies, he did a lot of B television. But he's another guy whose career should have been better than it was. And I can't help thinking that part of it may have been some prejudice for Asian American actors after the war. He advocated very vigorously for Asian American actors, by the way. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tapps. And we're going to close with my favorite song from Flower Drum Song. And my favorite version is not from the movie or the play, but it's by Tony Bennett. I don't think we've ever closed with Tony Bennett before. So here he is with Love Look Away from Flower Drum Song. Love Look Away Lonely though I may be Leave me and set me 